Hi, my name is Max. I am the chief designer of Notebook Design. And um, today I just want to talk about the software that we are using and our design process. You have probably seen, if you're here, one of the designs that we made, the chairs or one of the large scale installations that we did, like the largest one we ever did was a self-supporting dome structure made of cardboard covering a footprint of 198 square meters or roughly 2100 square feet. So. Um, that's the biggest one, but we made a multitude of other structures too. But uh, on the internet, online, uh, the the things that you will find mostly are the furniture pieces. And there we mainly use the slice form structures. And now we got a lot of messages lately, especially since we published the plans for the MC302 for free, um, asking us, so what software is it actually that you guys are using? And what's your designing process like? And I want to answer that today. And I'm going to start with the software, um, and then I'll start. I'll talk a little bit about why it absolutely does not matter which software you're using. But let's start with the software. Um, just to say that beforehand, we're not getting paid by any of these companies I'm going to mention. Um, it might sound like advertisement. I will give a few recommendations, but we're not getting paid by them. In fact, actually, we are paying them because for some of the softwares, we are having a license, a commercial license as a company. So um, this goes out to these companies. You're welcome, guys. Now, uh, for uh, slicing structures in the way that we make it, probably the um, most well-known and most famous software is Rhino with the Grasshopper plugin. It's a very sophisticated uh, 3D software. It comes with a lot of options. Um, it's a little tricky to learn, but the good thing about the software is that at least last time I checked, they are giving you a three month uh, trial period. So you actually get some time to learn the software. Um, now, if you're thinking about doing that, you actually need to take that time to work on it. Cause um, if you just do a little bit here and there, you might just, you know, waste some time, but that is actually a very generous offer. And I hope now that I'm making this video, I hope that option is still available. So you might want to check this out. Another great solution is the uh, Slicer for Fusion standalone solution, or actually it was called Slicer for Fusion 360. So that was a standalone version of the built-in slicer of Autodesk Fusion 360. The downside is that there's no more technical support for that standalone solution. You can still download it, but um, I believe they stopped the technical support about one year ago. It doesn't run on any of our machines anymore, but um, you might be able to, to make it work. All you need um, to do in order to have something to slice, because it doesn't, it doesn't include any modeler, is actually a software where you can create 3D models. So whether that's Blender, which is open source, or uh, you're using another software like uh, Maya or uh, 3D Studio Max or uh, Cinema 4D or whatever that is, you need um, something where you can create something to slice it. Um, if you are interested in it, um, because you might have heard of it before, and, and uh, it's actually very good, it is still part of Autodesk Fusion 360. I've tried that software myself, that's uh, at least two years back now, and uh, I have to say I liked it. Unfortunately, I uh, did not get deep enough into it and then I ended up uh, not getting the software just because that one month of testing, that was just not enough for me. But the uh, Autodesk Fusion 360, it contains a lot of options, especially in the fields of engineering. I'm actually an engineer myself uh, and I like that very much. So that might be something you want to look in. The trial period for this is one month. And then of course there's SketchUp. Now SketchUp is a software that I deeply love. It's very easy to learn. Uh, it's very intuitive. Um, it comes with the, the with the option of installing plugins through a SketchUp shop. A lot of these plugins are for free and they also have great free slicing software. Now that is really something uh, that you should consider because because it is not very expensive and because it's so intuitive and it's it does more than just slicing things. Um, I personally actually use it a lot. So that might be something um, that you want to check out. There's also a trial period for SketchUp. There used to be a, um, a version that was called SketchUp Make, 
that was released in 2017 for the last time and you could use that for a longer time. I do not know if that's still, still available, but um, you might wanna check it out. Well, that was the software part so far, um, but before you go, if you belong to those who are only here for the software information, there's one important thing. Please keep in mind that the software is just a tool and it doesn't matter what the software is capable of. It's always about what you are capable of doing with the software. Remember that some of the greatest designs that ever that have ever been made were made uh, on paper with a pen. Like when you think back to the work of um, Arne Jacobson or Ludwig Mies van der Rohe or Charles and Ray Eames or all these other great designers and architects, they actually designed on paper with a pen. And to this day, that's still true. It's the same thing for me. When I get into the process of building something uh, or planning something or making a concept, I am starting on paper. And the reason is in software, in any piece of software, regardless which one, there is never a button that says increase in credibility. You can't just click somewhere and everything becomes awesome all of a sudden. And because, because it doesn't exist, there's actually um, no need to wonder which software is the optimal solution for you. I personally work a lot in 2D CAD. I'm using slices too, uh, of course, but um, they're only a supporting tool because very often if you slice something and you run it through a software, there's always a few problems with it. And um, most likely it's human error. Most likely it's me sitting in front of the computer. I think so, but um, the software is not solving the questions that you will have when later on you actually produce it. Regardless if you cut it completely by hand, if whatever material you use, if you use jigsaw, a router bit, a carbon dioxide laser, a, an oscillating knife, there's so many different technologies out there and they all come with uh, different requirements and the slice is not taking care of that. No software actually is taking care of that. And even if they do to a certain, uh, to a certain degree, you should not rely on them. Because once you're somewhere, like we do a lot of exhibitions, for example, we used to actually before COVID. And um, once you're on an exhibition site and you're building something and something is wrong with the things that you have planned and you only have these pieces there and you have to work with them, you actually got to know your tools and you got to be able to cope with that situation on site. So um, in order to minimize all of these mistakes that can happen, it is really important to have a planning process, which is, um, which you actually did as careful as possible. And that means checking every single piece, especially with the large things. Uh, when I think back to the sneaker held dome structure, that, that large one, even with that big thing, the, the outline only for the main dome structure was uh, 12.6 kilometers, which is almost, um, oh, which is about eight miles-ish. That, that was the overall outline of all the pieces. And um, yeah, Every single piece was checked by hand manually. And um, this is something that is, that is just very important. Don't trust the software too much. Now, another thing that you always have to keep in mind is it is more important at the beginning to build a prototype than make a good rendering. Everybody can make a good rendering. Not, not, of course, not everybody, it's a, it's, it's a hard process, but you can go to some company and you can basically purchase that service. Or you have a friend at university or within your peer group and they're really good at visualizing things, um, but that's not the real deal. If you do something, make sure you prototype it. When I think back to the MC205, um, our first chair, that was actually our first quote unquote, very good object, then I have to admit we made 13 different prototypes before we came to the final geometry. And even um, from these prototypes, we made different versions and, and, and checked them out. And we, we kept working on it. And when you make a prototype of something, um, I know prototyping can be a little annoying at times. I personally do have fun prototyping most of the time, but sometimes it's also for me, it's also a, a nuisance. So, but even when you prototype something, prototype always with um, the problem in mind. So if the problem, for example, is to figure out whether the, the, the chair is comfortable, then you might just want to prototype that part of it. Um, you might have a base underneath, which is a box. It doesn't actually matter. You can just work your way around it as long as you keep the measurements real, meaning 
uh, as long as the base that you build underneath has the right height and you're just trying to figure out, does it work with my back? Does it work with my bottom? You know, you, you, get, you get the picture and that's true for any other object too. When you design um, and you are just about to render, to visualize the object and then publish them somewhere, then um, that is, that's a very fascinating thing, but it's actually cutting corners, so don't do that. It is okay though, though if you have a, um, a functioning object and you're satisfied with it, it is okay though to render it afterwards because you don't have the right pictures yet or you don't have the right setting yet or whatever, but make sure the object works first and then go into visualizations. And that's also a thing um, when it comes to social media, I know with Behance and, um, and Instagram and Facebook and whatever, it's always tempting to, uh, you know, just spit out designs and show it to the public. But um, design is not content. So that content creation that some people do, where they, where they do something, where they can just do quick things over and over and over, with design, it doesn't work like that. If you're really good at, um, at, at baking muffins, for example, I love muffins, <laughs> um, and, and they're just very beautiful, and there's beautiful decoration and whatsoever, and you take them out of the oven and you show all these beautiful pictures, that's, that's a good way to create a lot of content. While with design, you actually have to work through the entire process before you can show it to somebody. So don't get tempted to do that. That's also the reason why for designers, it takes a long time to build a decent audience. Um, also here, I can only say, do not try to cut corners. Always think of what you're trying to achieve. And if you don't really know where to start, let's say you, you wanna make a table, um, just take the, the, the measurements from the internet, if you can find it, or just measure a table that you like. Measure it, and then you have the height. You know how wide it needs to be. Like all these things, they're already in you. Just take it from an object that you know it works and all of a sudden it turns out, well, that this height is just perfect for me or it needs to be a little lower, like an inch or whatever. And, um, and then you start designing your object accordingly, but you have a few things where you know, okay, this is set. The height is set and it's gonna be flat at the bottom. That's set too. And now I can play with it. Because keep in mind, um, especially when you're young and uh, or you're new to the profession, um, design is a real profession, but from the get-go, you have to build habits that will help you throughout your entire career. Now, I want to say that about myself. Um, we did all these projects for clients like um, like Microsoft, Volvo, uh, Adobe, Mercedes-Benz, uh, BMW. There's been so many companies that we worked for in actually all across Europe and North America. But we started in a uh, tiny little workshop. In fact, it wasn't even a workshop. It was just a cool room uh, about a decade ago. And we didn't even have proper cutting technology. We started the, uh, the company with a total of $500. That was our complete budget. And um, we worked our way up. So it's very possible. And back in the day, people thought we were a bit crazy to do that, you know, working on cardboard, but it's very doable. And the habits that you form very early on they, they will always follow you. And if you very early on go in the habit, I hope no one does that, but get in the habit of uh, copying other people's designs, um, then you might continue doing that too. Um, so yeah, be just be aware of that and, 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 and don't do it. It's okay though to be inspired. Now there's always that thing when people say, uh, steal like an artist. I believe there's also a book that has been published with that title. It's a fun book. It has all these graphics in there. Um, Here's the thing about that. Um, certain shapes and, and certain things, that, or let's say, let's put it that way. There's not really something fundamentally new in architecture or furniture design or product design or whatever. There are a few new things here and there. There's new materials, new procedures, um, the integration of digital technology, that's all true. But in general, everything has been there before. And for a designer, the only question is, can I make it more efficient? Can I make it better? Can I help more people? Can I make, can I make it more affordable? Which does not mean you have to make it cheap, uh, but can I make it more affordable? Maybe can I make it last in a different environment? You know, some things I'm talking to you from Canada, uh, some things that work in Canada in this climate might not work in a climate in, like in Colombia because of a very different, um, very different climate. Um, I've actually never been to Colombia, so I just assume it's 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 hot and a, and a little and a little uh, moist. But I actually don't know that. So if you're from Colombia and I said something wrong, uh, 
please correct me. But um, yeah, these are the things that, that we're actually working on. And it is all right sometimes to get inspired by somebody, but believe it or not, if I work on a project, I never look at examples from other designers first because I know they get stuck in my head and then I'm staying with this picture and I, I don't find that helpful. You might think uh, differently of it, but, and that's all right. All I'm just trying to say is that um, it is creating your own language is something that is important to work on. And here's a good piece of advice, I believe, until you have found your own language, make getting the job done your language. That's always a good thing to keep in mind. So I really hope this was uh, helpful. I did it unscripted, so I hope it made sense. I, uh, I wish you all the best. If you have any questions, feel free to ask us. We'll try to answer all questions as fast as we can. Unfortunately, sometimes on social media, we can't um, catch up with it because we're just busy with other things. You know, we're still running a shop. We still have the company in Germany and here in Canada. But um, yeah, I wish you all the best and uh, do great work. The world needs more good design. Take care, my friends. Bye-bye.